On this channel, I have reviewed a lot of small cameras. Some of them good, some of them not so good. So today I'm gonna to brutally rank 10 of the smallest cameras that I've ever tested to create what I'm gonna to call Tom's amazing list of the best and also not the best small mirrorless cameras featuring a mystery guest. Yes, that's right. As an added bonus, I have a special guest with me who will be making an appearance at some point in this video to throw in their miniature camera into the mix. So let's get started with a good one and that's the Panasonic Lumix GM one, which is actually behind me. Let me find it. Oh, come here. Now, I actually bought this a little while back and paired it with a super slimline manual focus pancake lens, which is certainly not this thing. And that's because I was going away on a ski trip and I just needed something that would fit into my pocket that I could just pull in and out every now and again. I also wanted something with a decent sized sensor so that hopefully it would capture images with a fairly good dynamic range and plenty of detail. And this thing seemed to tick all of the boxes. In fact, I liked it so much, I kept hold of it. In fact, it's the only camera in this lineup which I haven't either sold or given back after testing, which probably should say a lot. Now, I'll confess, I haven't really used this camera all that much since the trip, but I do really have a soft spot for it. I said it's far from being perfect because the main gripe I have with it is that the raw images can get a little bit noisy if you push it too hard in Lightroom and the autofocus certainly isn't the greatest. Obviously, if you're using a manual focus lens like I was, it's not so much of a problem. But overall, I would confidently say that this is probably one of my favorite small cameras to date. And so I am gonna put this in the A tier. Back home on your shelf you go, young man. Next up is what I have officially crowned as the world's smallest interchangeable lens mirrorless camera, and that's the Samsung NX Mini. Now, for some reason, nobody seems to have an official scientific verdict as to which mirrorless camera is the world's smallest. Maybe because nobody actually cares, but I do, all right, I do. So in this short video up here, I actually calculated the volume of the top contenders, and the NX Mini came out as the smallest of the bunch, probably. Anyway, if you actually saw my original review on the Samsung NX Mini. I actually ended up taking this thing with me on a short trip to Calgary in Alberta, Canada, which is now the place I call home. As it turns out, it was a great choice for the trip because this camera is just so lightweight and slimline. It glides in and out of your jeans pocket with ease, even with the 9mm prime lens attached to it. For a camera that was made 10 years ago now, I just remember it being really quick, not only to shoot and focus, but it also booted up within like two seconds. Wow. It has a flip screen, which unfortunately the GM1 doesn't have. It's okay. We still like you. It's fine. And it's also touch sensitive, which is really handy when you're dealing with a small camera because fiddly little buttons can get a bit annoying. Like I said, the AF was fast and accurate. And I mean, honestly, I can't think of many things that I didn't like about it. I guess maybe the choice of lenses does suck a little bit because there's only three to actually pick from. So that's not a huge amount of choice, but that didn't bother me all that much, to be honest. The price also sucks. They are extremely expensive to buy these days. I think I paid around 600 pounds for the camera and two lenses which is pretty gross. I actually ended up selling this camera which I do regret even to this day but the reason I did that is because I didn't feel like I was going to use it enough. Now because I'm constantly testing out new cameras and lenses each week I've always got something else that I really need to be shooting with so I didn't want this thing rotting in a drawer somewhere because that felt like a bit of a waste. But if I didn't do this whole thing as a job I absolutely would have kept hold of it and it would almost certainly be my everyday carry along and for that reason I think I'm going to have to put this one in the S tier. On a side note Samsung or somebody from Samsung if you're listening please come back to us start making mirrorless cameras again you did a great job before or even just update the NX mini just for a laugh I'd appreciate it thanks so also on that same trip to Canada I also took along another camera and that camera has created a fair amount of controversy shall we say on this channel in the past and that's the Sigma FPL. Now if you don't already know aside from making awesome lenses Sigma do occasionally delve into the world of cameras too but whenever the guys at Sigma do that they just can't seem to help themselves and they always end up making something that's a little bit out there. To be fair the FPL I would say is probably one of the more normal cameras that they've made to date other than the fact that it's absolutely tiny and still manages to house a full frame 61 megapixel sensor making it one of if not the the smallest full frame camera ever made. The other small camera being the original FP, which was released before this one. Now, as a result, the image quality is top tier, as you would expect, and I was absolutely blown away by the detail that this thing was able to capture. You can also do some pretty crazy video stuff too, including 4K 12-bit raw capture, but all of that comes with a few caveats and problems of its own. So I've discussed that in greater detail in the full video up here, if you're interested. Anyway, this camera has a very, 
very dedicated fan base and usually they get a little bit touchy with me if they sense I'm about to say anything even remotely bad about their beloved FP. So if you happen to be a fan of the Sigma FP or the FPL then for the next few seconds can you please just turn down your speaker volume and just read the subtitles at the bottom of the screen just trust me on this one okay? Have you done it? Okay, good. Anson, that includes you too, mate. I know you're watching. Okay, so fundamentally, this is not a completely terrible camera. The image quality is very, very good. The video specs are wild, as I've already mentioned, and the autofocus is plenty good enough. But unfortunately, it's also played by a whole list of, let's call them design quirks, that I personally think make this a fairly irritating camera to use. So for that reason, I am gonna stick this one in tier C and just pray that the FP fans won't find my new home address. Okay, you can turn the volume back up now. Volume back up. Good. We're good? What a great camera. Am I right? Probably the best of this century, I would say. <laughs> Don't hurt my family. Okay, so moving on to the next camera, we have the Pentax QS1, which I reviewed not too long ago, actually. Now, this is widely considered as the OG of small mirrorless digital cameras, and I remember absolutely loving many of the features that this thing offers. For such a tiny camera, the design and handling is honestly pretty faultless. I completely get now why so many people loved these things when they first came out, and they still continue to love them even in 2024. I also loved how Pentax put ND filters into some of their lenses which is absolutely genius. I wish it was a feature that was included on more lenses, if I'm honest. Overall, this camera system is pretty faultless, apart from one fairly significant issue, and that's image quality. Now, that tiny compact size sensor just isn't gonna be much use in low light, and even when shooting on a bright sunny day, when you push the raw files too much afterwards, it does generate a fair bit of noise. And when you compare the image quality generated by this camera to all of the other cameras in this lineup, when you zoom into the photos, the results do look a little bit mushy and that means you can't really crop in too tightly or you're going to risk degrading your shots too greatly. And ultimately it's great that the camera has so many cool features and handles really well and looks good but if at the end you're left with a result that's pretty average to be fair then for me that's kind of a deal breaker. So I think it deserves a place in the B tier and honestly if the image quality was just even a little bit better this would definitely be in the A tier or maybe even in the S tier. Up next is another tiny camera I have taken with me on my travels and that's the Olympus EPM1 which is actually the smallest mirrorless camera that Olympus ever made. Now I actually brought this along with me to a trip to Osaka in Japan and it really was a great travel companion. I think this camera's biggest sin though is that it's a as sin. But looks aside, it's honestly a really handy little pocketable point and shoot, especially if you pair it with an equally small lens. If I remember rightly, they're pretty affordable too because not many people are buying them, probably because of their questionable looks. But the autofocus is fast and accurate, the image quality was very good. The only thing that really makes it lose points for me is maybe the handling because it is pretty slippery to hold and the buttons and dials I remember being very small and fiddly. So although I do have a soft spot for this EPM1, it's certainly not the best camera in this lineup and so it's going to find itself in the B tier. Right, it's now that time to reveal our special guest and I don't know why I'm doing this with my hands but who else would be more fitting for this video than the queen of tiny cameras herself? Emily, or as you probably know her, Micro Four Nerds. The Lumix GM5 is probably my all-time favourite tiny camera. It's probably the most premium tiny camera ever made as well. It has a magnesium alloy body. It's about the size of a pack of cards. It's absolutely tiny. And it even has a back thumb dial, so you can actually use it more like a traditional larger camera. It feels like a small camera without very many compromises. You even have a hot shoe and an EVF. It's crazy. But most importantly, it comes in fun colours. It's a camera that's so nice, I've bought it twice. I have this red version and I'm still on the lookout for what can only be described as the lumpy green version. You'll see what I mean if we put a graphic on screen. It's such a strange camera and it's hideous and I have to have it. So I think the GM5 is versatile, it's small, it's powerful and it deserves to be really high on your tier list. Well, after that glowing review, I am very tempted to put this in the S tier, but seeing as I've not actually handled or tested this camera myself, yet, I am going to have to be cautious here and place it on the border between the S and A tiers. Oh, and if you haven't already, be sure to head over to Emily's channel and check out her full review of the GM5. Next up is the Nikon 1J5, and if you're not familiar with this range of cameras, that's probably because this was part of Nikon's first ever attempt in producing mirrorless interchangeable lens cameras, and after just a few years, the whole Nikon 1 system was
was scrapped. Now the reason why I picked this J5 model out of the total of 11 Nikon One cameras that were ever produced is that firstly it's definitely the best looking one of the bunch and secondly it's one of the last cameras that they ever made for this range and therefore includes a lot of more modern features. Handling wise it's super lightweight, super small and generally a complete joy to use. If you can forgive this annoying Wi-Fi button that if you press it accidentally locks up the entire camera which is infuriating. But that aside, I do absolutely love this camera. Just how quick and quiet it is. The AF is lightning fast. The fast readout speeds mean that you can shoot with an electronic shutter and not have to worry too much about rolling shutter. It's just a very small and stealthy camera that I think is absolutely perfect for candid styles of photography like street. Now, as much as my gut is telling me put this in the S tier, I just can't honestly do that, mainly because of that stupid Wi-Fi button. If that wasn't a thing, it would be right up there at the top but as it stands i'm going to punish it and drop it down to a tier which is still a pretty good rating to be fair no you know what actually it's going to sit on the line it's going to sit on the line between a and s and it can sit there and think long and hard about what it could have been so this is the nxc3 and not only is it one of the smallest and lightest mirrorless cameras that sony has ever released it's also one of the oldest but that also means that it's one of the most affordable cameras in this entire lineup which is certainly a plus point and i think i remember buying this for just under a hundred dollars I think it was, which for a camera with a large APS-C size sensor is pretty crazy. It also uses the same Sony E lens mount as all of Sony's current mirrorless cameras. So that means that the lenses you buy for this thing will be compatible with newer and more expensive models should you eventually upgrade to one of those later down the line. And that means that this is a pretty good starter option. The image quality is great. The AF, although a little bit sluggish by today's standards, is still perfectly usable. And it does have just about everything you would want in terms of features. All of that said, I can't say I love it. Don't get me wrong, it's incredibly practical and affordable and a great beginner camera, but the build quality does feel very cheap and plasticky and it just feels a little bit soulless. Put it another way, it's probably not a camera that you would go out and buy and then rush out to all of your mates to go and tell them about it. So for that, I am going to have to put this one in the C tier. Now, speaking of mid cameras, here's the Canon EOS M3. Now, this is by no means the small List mirrorless camera made by Canon. I think that award goes to the M2, but be sure to correct me in the comments below if I'm wrong about that. However, it's certainly the smallest Canon camera that I've ever tested, so I thought it was probably worth throwing into the mix. Now on paper, this is a very capable camera, offering a nice large APS-C size sensor and along with it, good image quality. The build quality is also really good. There are a ton of buttons and dials, which I really liked, and the larger hand grip especially makes it nice and easy to hold. But the biggest right for me was the AF. Compared to all of the other cameras that we've spoken about in this lineup, the AF on this thing is by far the worst. Now just to be clear, that's not me saying that it's terrible or completely unusable, it's just not that great compared to the other options that we've looked at so far and I do remember it feeling noticeably slow to lock onto targets, which did bug me a little bit. Kind of hard to describe without sounding too harsh, but nothing really excites me about this camera. I feel kind of indifferent towards it. It's how you would say, meh. Now, I am very tempted to put this in tier C, but I do think that is pretty harsh considering that the only thing I have bad to say about this camera is that the AF is a bit slow, and that is, let's be honest, to be expected for older cameras. So I'm gonna find a compromise and stick it in no man's land between tier B and C. Okay, so I've arguably saved one of the best till last. I mean, it's probably one of my favorite cameras at least, the Fujifilm X-M1. Now, the reason why I like this camera so much isn't necessarily because it's the fastest or offers the best features. It's just because it's one of those cameras that really intrigues me. It has a pretty weird backstory as it was kind of like the awkward third album for Fujifilm. They released the X-Pro1, which was a big hit. Then there was the X-E1, which was also a big hit. Then they thought, we've got this. We've nailed it, boys. Third time lucky, let's go. And then they came out with the X-M1 and it didn't do so well, which is kind of weird to be honest because it offers pretty much all of the same features as its older siblings, minus an EVF, and it still ended up not selling very well. But I have covered many of those reasons up here in this video if you're interested. Now, I did say at the start of this video that the Lumix GM1 was the only camera in this lineup that I ended up keeping and not selling, which is true because I did sell the XM1 shortly afterwards, again, because I bought an X-Pro2 and I didn't use the XM1, blah, blah, blah. But technically, I still own an XM1. You can probably see it 
down here. But this is not a standard XM1, as I've covered in a recent video. This is actually an XM1 that has been converted to shoot IR. Now this was axed after just version one, so we never got to see anything other than the XM1, but it was replaced spiritually by the XA range, which I have an example of here. And this also appears to have been axed. Hmm. But the reason why I prefer this XM over the XA range is because these are very much plasticky and don't have a proper X-Trans sensor. This XM1 has a nice solid metal build and just feels way more premium. Now that said, this camera is by no means perfect. The AF is not the fastest, there are very few customizable buttons and the video record button on the back here is very easy to knock and you end up filming your feet half the time. But even so, I still love this camera, probably because I am a huge sucker for vintage inspired cameras, it is well known, and probably because I have a soft spot for it because it's an underdog. Do I want to put this in the A tier category? Yes. Is that a same thing to do? Well, looking at the other cameras below it, absolutely not. So let's make a compromise and stick it between tier A and B and as a result we've probably ended up with the most indecisive looking ranking chart I have ever seen. Now looking at this final rundown I'm going to be honest I didn't think that the Samsung would be the only S tier camera on this list but here we are. I guess I just really appreciate the Samsung simplicity and the fact that it just works. It didn't give me any headaches, it did exactly what I needed it to do and for a small camera it really does tick all the boxes. It's fast, reliable, easily pocketable and captures a damn good photo when you need it. So what more could you want? An EVF. The, the answer to that question is an EVF if you're wondering. Bye.